Welcome to our webinar where we'll be discussing the, the future of uh, dentistry post COVID. But we definitely would like to go over the experience that we have with uh, uh, our very special uh, speaker here today that is playing two roles. And she's playing the role of a COVID patient. So telling us her story from, you know, within and sharing with us how it was and what she knows now that, uh, you know, we can all learn from. Uh, Dr. Bola Sherembo, you're welcome. Welcome. You can, uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself in a few minutes. We also have uh, the president of the Nigerian Dental Association, Dr. Evelyn Eshikena, so she's here. Uh, she'll be sharing with us some of the protocols that she's been working on uh, to set guidelines for dentists to practice safely, you know, uh, you know their profession um, during this COVID uh, pandemic. Just one second, want to get the last batch into the meeting. All right, Dr. Naboya, if you are here, please wave so that I can make you a co-host. All right, raise your hand so I can make you a co-host. So thank you everyone who has joined us from Lagos, from beyond Lagos and even beyond Nigeria. Uh, we have some guests as far as uh, Ghana. I could see some guests uh, from Cote d'Ivoire. I see some guests from Senegal. Dr. Taha Emni, you're welcome. Uh, so Ghana again, uh, you're welcome. We have some guests from uh, Kigali, Rwanda. So thank you for joining us here. Uh, so it's not just a, a webinar, uh, you know, in a, for Nigerian dentists. We want to make sure that everybody, you know, beyond, you know, uh, Nigeria, we want to get your, um, your, your experience, your input, I have Dr. Tutu here logging in from Houston, Texas. You're welcome. So everybody's contribution will be very welcome. And we want to uh, get started with the webinar because we have a lot to share. So I will ask uh, just a request I have, um, Dr. Shikana, is it possible that um, we, uh, you don't share your screen now uh, since you will be speaking later? Let me just see if I can get back to the previous, all right? So let me stop your sharing. We'll just go with the full, um, okay, with the original screen we had, and then when it's time for you to come in, we'll get back to your screen. So I'm glad that that is working. So That's fine, okay, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, we are all dentists here, and we are all worried. Uh, I, I will really say that word, you know, it is a lot of fear going on and we need to be able to understand uh, where we're going uh, based on the information that we know today. All right. So there's still lots that we don't know, but based on the information that we have today, where are we going? We know that the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, has affected the, the world globally. We know that our practice uh, of dentistry will no longer be the same. So it's no longer a question of before COVID and what will dentistry be after COVID. It's more like before, you know, COVID-19 and now because the COVID-19, COVID is here to stay. So it's going to affect our life, you know, um, for, forever. Dentistry will no longer be the same, All right? Professor Ademo, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We know you will be glad to have your, your input. So how do we go from here? All right, what will change in the future of dentistry? This is what we like to share today. We'll go over the guidelines, but before we go further, we need to understand how it feels to be, you know, a survivor of the coronavirus. And as uh, I had mentioned earlier, we have Dr. Bola Shambo that is running four practices in the UK. She's a, a special a consultant, a periodontist, and you know how it feels. Perio, you are going deep into these pockets. 
you know, so you are even more exposed, you know, among the dental professionals. So we'd like to hear your experience from the patient perspective, from the professional perspective, but you're also involved in uh, setting up some of the guidelines and working with the NHS in the UK, where you're based in Milton Keynes, and I've been to, 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 to visit your practice there, that in Milton Keynes and St. Albans. So we know that you have world of experience to share with us today. And um, on this note, I would like to get you to unmute yourself and let's hear from you, you know, and we really thank God for your life. We know that uh, a lot of people have not made it, you know, and we really thank God for your life. And thank you for sharing and being here with us today. Dr. Shango. Hello. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amy, for having me um, here today. Um, it's a great honor to be able to speak to so many people. And it's, um, for me, it's also very special because um, there was a stage I thought I would never, yesterday was my birthday and I thought I would never see it. Um, <clears throat> and it's just a big honor to be here. When you asked me to do this, um, at the time I was probably coughing my guts out and I thought, oh, I've got to be able to get well. And here I am. <clears throat> well, the one thing I would like to say is that uh, for a lot of us, we probably thought this virus, it's all the way over in China. Um, I suppose it was similar to the Ebola crisis when there were a few cases in a faraway land and we were worried about it, but not too worried because we thought it's very far away. Um, but this is a pandemic and it's affected so many people. There are already over a million people um, three million people who've been affected by COVID. The good news is that majority of those who have been affected, um, it was mild to moderate. The biggest problems are those um, like us or like myself who had a more severe um, um, case of uh, uh, the, the disease. And it wasn't a very nice thing. Now, like has already been said, I'm a periodontist. So I scale, I polish and scale, and I love my air polishing. And then I, I invested in a um, laser and it's all aerosol. So yes, I used my mask, um, but of course, none of us in those days were using FFP3. In fact, I don't think I even knew what FFP3 was. Um, the first FFP3, I actually physically saw was my, from my next door neighbor who's a builder because they use it a lot. Because for most of us, it was just a surgical mask. And sometimes we're naughty because we've got the shields and you want to put your loops on and you take your shield off because you think you're nice and safe and you've got everything else off. But the biggest problem with this transmission, with this um, virus was, this SARS-CoV-2 virus was, it was airborne. So it's, and the biggest, also the biggest problem was at the time when we were looking at it, we were thinking, well, we'll ask patients, do they have any symptoms? Um, and we're all safe. And then I was hit by the disease. So what happened? So the very first thing that I noticed, I'm just going to quickly move forward a little bit to the next slide. <clears throat> and, I started, um, the one thing I forgot to mention is that I'm also asthmatic and that's bad news because that straight away puts me in the vulnerable group. So the very first thing I had was I had a dry cough, but the dry cough I had was I thought I was reacting to flowers because somebody had, a patient had brought in a big bunch of flowers. So I thought, oh, I'm re reacting to the flowers. Also, there was a lot more antiseptic being used. So you've got to be very careful about the antiseptics you have in the practice. And we'll come back to that later on. And then the next thing I had, I got home and I was very tired. If a lot of you know me, you probably have got emails from me at four o'clock in the morning. So once in a while, I do get a bit tired. So I thought, oh, I just need to have a sleep. I think within two days, I was at a stage where 
I was drowning. And I couldn't understand how I had gone from somebody who was hale and hearty, and within two days, I was drowning. <clears throat> We're lucky over here in England because the ambulance came quite quickly, um, and I was able to get quite prompt treatment. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and I was diagnosed with um, COVID-19, and I also had pneumonia. And I couldn't understand how I'd gone from seeing patients two days before to needing oxygen. Um, luckily, um, I'm here today. And I think I also have somebody else on the line here who is uh, Dr. Adeloye. Are you here? Is she? I think she's here. Is she one of the participants? Can you raise your hand, please, doctor? Dr. Adeloye, Dr. Larry Adeloye. Unless you unmute everybody and then you, she may yes. talk. Larry, I see Larry. Yeah. So if it's the same Larry, but let me make you a co-host so you can unmute yourself. Larry. Is it the same? Okay, I'll just, if she, now the reason why I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Larry. So the other things were muscle pain sore throat, fatigue. Now the fatigue, I mean, when we're talking fatigue, we're talking about malaria with a PhD. I mean, you can't even get up to go to the toilet. That's how t fatigued you are. Lots of mucus. So everything on this sheet I had. There are some other symptoms that are coming up. And the newest one is loss of taste or smell. Some people have both of them. Some people have that as the first thing they're looking at. Headache, chest pain, chills, repeated shaking with chills. Now, the, um, that picture there is a special picture. Oh, That's think, actually me. Uh, <laughs> is it possible that you share your screen? We're still on my screen or? Oh, you can't see anything. We can't see your screen yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes, if you can just sorry. So this can, screen can go down. Okay. Oh, I had unmuted the wrong. Oh, sorry about that. Never mind. Yes, I didn't realize. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, that's your lovely daughter. So this is a photograph of uh, Dr. Adeloye and I. That's pretty little me. Thirty-three years ago, I was her chief bridesmaid. Now, little did we know that both of us would be ending up in hospital with COVID-19. I mean, what are the chances of that? And I didn't even, I hadn't spoken to her, so we didn't pass it to each other. She's also a dentist. So that just shows you just how easy it is for dentists to actually get this condition. There are other dentists that also um, happen to um, end up on, um, on ventilators. There are quite a lot of dentists that we're aware of that have had this. So it's a very real thing and we are at the highest risk of getting this condition. So it's very, very serious and we have to do something about it. <coughs> so what's the problem? It's this. Someone sneezes, that is what is there. And it lasts, that can last up to three hours. So that is the problem. So if you've got a mask and you've taken it off, Bits of the virus are in this little mist. So if we look at this, we've got the aerosol. We've got the, <coughs> sorry. We've got the large spray droplets. Here it says six meters. It's more like 13 meters. So even with social distancing at six meters, if somebody coughs or sneeze, if somebody sneezes, Look at that. That's a cough. So this is what we're having problems with. And we are also generating aerosols. So we're sitting in an environment where the virus is working. Can I get rid of this? So it can remain airborne for up to three hours. It can travel up to 13 feet. 
not the six feet we're being told now. And it's approximately 0.125 micrograms, which is usually carried by water droplet that's one micron and with very high exposure. So how long does the virus last? In the air, three hours. And that's a significant thing. I'll come back to that as well. On cardboard, 24 hours. On plastic, two to three days. And on stainless steel, two to three days. I'll come back to that as well. So a major problem is, as a dental profession, we're doing aerosol generating procedures. So we're generating these aerosols. So we're having both indirect contact and direct contact. And from contaminated surfaces as well, if we touch those surfaces, there's a problem. The other thing we've got to be very aware of, susceptible individuals could be both from staff and patients coming in. And that's just from one patient. So, <clears throat> How are we going to prepare for this? Like Dr. Amy said, we're doing it now, not when we reopen. So just give me one second. We have to identify the risks in the practice. So we have to look at the employees, all the dentists working and the patients and go through each one, one by one. <coughs> And we have to get a plan in place. We have to look at this. <coughs> Sorry, one second. <coughs> we have to look at the risks. And these include sources of infection. So the source of infection could also come from the staff. And it could come from the patients. And it could come from anybody coming into the practice. But one big thing we've got to be also aware of is that when we closed, let's say you had 10 staff, don't think you can have 10 staff again when you open, because some people may actually <clears throat> have the COVID-19. Some people may be looking after somebody who's had it. So there'll be some absenteeism. Now, the big thing we've got to look at, how are we going to do social distancing? <coughs> how are we going to deliver PPE. I'm not sure what it's like in Nigeria at the moment, but in England, it's a massive problem. Getting FFP3, FFP2 is very difficult. Very important training staff. We have to update policies and procedures. So things like daily temperatures and symptom documentation. So for example, every day, when the patients, when the staff come in, there is a folder they have to go into and put their temperature and any symptoms they may have. <coughs> then there's a questionnaire for patients and they have to also do their temperature and then policies for staff. There is a lot to do. So even though there's lockdown, all these should be done, happening now. <coughs> so let's look at workplace controls. So what we're looking at is at the top will be the best, most effective way to, and that would mean eliminating or removing the hazard. We know that until there's a vaccine, that's not going to be possible. So the substitution we can't replace the hazard so the first thing we're looking to isolate people from the hazard administrative control is change the way people work and that these are very big things we have to look at because it's not business as usual anymore a lot of things are going to change <clears throat> so one of the things we're looking at would be what do we do about the air We've talked about this aerosol that's in the air with the COVID-19 or any other virus that's going to come. We're going to have to start looking at decontaminator units. Have we got um, um, Margaret Solomon, Mrs. Margaret Solomon online? Dr. Amy?
Dr. Amy? Uh, didn't realize no, this is Solomon online. This is Solomon, let's see if we could see through the name. Because when the one of the most important thing is air exchange. Now in the hospital, we're not talking about doing something like a theater, because in the theater they've got um, um, special rooms that have been done so that they're, um, they're almost very, very good air. In the surgery, that's not going to be possible. So what we're also looking at is things like this that work very, very well. There's a cost implication of that. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen um, these evacuation systems before. They were used um, with, for, oh, sorry. They, they, were used, they were used for removal of mercury vapors. So there are companies that are now doing things like that to try and help with evacuation. And as, as you can see, the patient actually is wearing, is having, has a rubber dam. This patient is under nitrous oxide uh, sedation. So we have to start looking at um, systems like that. Then in addition, this was a simple thing that was made in China. That, that was one of my classmates, not one of my classmates, one of my um, nurses, classmate. They made a simple, it was a little plastic sheath and they've got um, cling film that they put around there and they're working under there all to try and reduce the amount of aerosol that comes out. So here he's just wearing a normal surgical mask. They've got this shield, everything is covered, everything is clean, and they're working under there. So after each patient, they can take this off, clean this blue frame and replace uh, something on there. But these are all ideas that people are trying to come up with. How do we reduce the aerosol that comes towards both the, the nurse and the dentist. The other thing you'll find now is that we all have to always work for hand dentistry when doing any aerosol generating procedure, because it's very important that we use the suction. So administrative control, what are we looking at there? With administrative control, a lot of changes. Right now, people are very, very worried. Not just the patients, but the staff as well. I mean, not yes, the staff as well, because the staff are thinking, hey, I'm hearing that this COVID affects dentists more. How am I going to go to work? Here in England, there have been people who've actually given up the job saying we can't go back. So it's very important that we communicate we have um, meetings with our staff. We explain what's going on. We ex you know, get them trained on how to handle things and just let them know that we're going to be looking after staff and patients alike. So the other thing is telemedicine. That's something we're doing a lot of now. In England, we're on total shutdown. So there are only, I think, 150 practices which are designated practices which are functioning at the moment. All other practices are doing remote, um, remote consultations, remote emergency control. So it's telemedicine. So for example, today I've had a patient who had a swelling. I've had a phone call from him. I've had photographs. I've done an inter um, a consultation with him over the phone with video. And I've been able to decide what treatment he needs, which was some antibiotics. And I've also sent something remotely to the pharmacist and he's been able to go and pick it up. He doesn't even live anywhere close to me at the moment. So all that's been done remotely. So that's going to become the norm. And I'll tell you why as we go further down. So a lot of consultations will be done on the phone. A lot of forms will be done on the phone because if you're trying to think about it, we're trying to limit the amount of time the patient stays in the reception room. So the, we're hoping that the patient comes in, goes straight <coughs> to, to the surgery, and then goes straight out. So limited time in the reception room. So what is going to be important is the pre-op screening. 
So once again, we're going to ask all those questions. At the beginning of the um, talk, I talked about all the various symptoms. But one of the problems with this, all those symptoms is that we now know that there are a large number of people who are asymptomatic carriers. So they, can, they have no symptoms at all, but they could actually be passing on the virus. So now in the UK, we treat everybody as if they've got COVID-19. So that way you don't miss anything. Another thing that's going to change, we're going to have to look at how we manage our books. And the reason being, for example, we've got a um, urgent care center that's working at the moment. Because we don't have a machine that's cleaning the air, when, once we do a procedure that's a, um, aerosol generating, what we've got to do is first of all wait 30 minutes for that aerosol to settle before the nurse then comes and cleans up. So we're looking at a 45 gap between each patient. So what's now happening is that you have a situation where you're seeing two, three patients in a session. Now, if you think of how you were practicing before, how are you going to see all your patients? So we've got to find a way to manage the appointment books. So the other thing that you've got to start thinking of is we've also got to think about people who are vulnerable, people who are shielding, people who have um, who, who don't normally go out, but they're only coming because they've got an emergency. So you've got to start looking at when do you put those patients, when are they seen? You've got to start thinking, well, if I've got to wear all this expensive gear when I'm treating a patient, I'll need to put all the patients who need AGPs in one session. So all that has to be managed. But then most important of all, is that you've got to start thinking of that social distancing. How do I manage a patient? So we've started with journey through the waiting room. Well, that starts in the car park. So for example, in, in the practice, but once we've done all the interviews over the, um, once we've done all the interviews over the phone, when the patient comes in, they're asked some of those questions again especially the COVID questions, and then a temperature is taking. The whole idea is that we want to make sure that that patient isn't carrying the disease. And then they come into the waiting room. Now we've got to start thinking of the, the door. If they're touching the door, the receptionist is going to clean that door. And then as soon as they come in, they've got to sterilize their hands with, I mean, disinfect their hands, and then go straight into the reception, <coughs> straight into the surgery. Everybody's got to be ready for what they're going to have to do. But what's very important, like I said, about the communication, we've got to warn the patients and let them know why we're doing what we're doing. And they will also be <coughs> very happy about that. So we also have to look at the clinic protocols. At the moment, we write on, we write on in the computer, get rid of paper, get rid of magazines, get rid of anything, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> anything the patient touches has to be cleaned or thrown away. So if the patient is going to use a pen, you have to clean that pen or give that pen to the patient to take away. So all these are cost implications. <coughs> so <coughs> I put this picture here. This is our waiting room. So the first day we decided to close down, we had patients coming in. That was the reception desk. We didn't want the patients going to the reception desk. So we blocked everything so that when the patients came in, they went straight into the surgery. <coughs> what we're going to do is make something like this, which is a glass barrier, so that when the patients come in, <coughs> there's no contact.
So, the, so here are our nurses. This was the day they were being fit tested. The problem with FFP3 masks, you have to be fit tested. So if this mask doesn't work, you have to get another one. <coughs> then this is another type of mask. It's called a powered air purifying respirator. Now, this is one of my colleagues. When she, he, she couldn't find, she's a neural surgeon. When she couldn't find the mask, this is what she was wearing. And here's some more stuff at the urgent care center. Once again, that was the day they got all their PPE. So they were trying it all on before patients come. <coughs> Thank you very much for listening. I know it's been, that's my family. And I'm glad to be able to be here. I know I'm not 100%. My two daughters, my husband, unfortunately, he also had it as well, quite bad, but I'm happy to say he's also okay. Thank you very much for listening. Amazing. <coughs> wow, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharon Ball, for really sharing your personal, personal story, your journey through, you know, uh, how you, 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 you survived the coronavirus, but also, uh, as a practical surviving. <laughs> so uh, we really appreciate you also sharing the guide guidelines and this is actually introducing us to the next um, speaker. Um, <laughs> uh, she's going to talk more about um, the future, of course, of, uh, of, of dentistry, you know, post COVID. And again, we have to probably talk about removing that post you know, behind the COVID. We have um, Dr. Maria Naboya, who is joining me to moderate this session. I don't know if she, can you, Dr. Naboya? Okay, good. Dr. Naboya, can you? Um... I'm here. Okay, great, great, great. So you, you are our moderator <laughs> for today. I started it, but I want you to take it up from here and uh, introducing no uh, some comments about Dr. Shayombo's presentation, which is yes, perspective, and you know, introducing the next um, speaker. Perhaps you can unmute okay. and put your... your I've unmuted, I've unmuted. Mariana, I've unmuted. She's a passionate dentist and uh, decided to shut down her practice, you know, as soon as she had you know, uh, had the good news about you know this pandemic. So you will share with us as well. I'm, I'm unmuted. All right. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. All right. Good. It's my nice speaking. Uh, hearing from Dr. Shoyombo. That was a very great one. We're happy to know that we have survivors. So there's no stigma. There's no running away from the truth. And we're glad that she survived this, so she's a victor. We're going to call in Dr. Ashikena, who is our NDA president. She's going to give us what we need to change in dentistry in this COVID era. We are saying it is not post-COVID. We've had pre-COVID, we are in COVID now. We don't know when COVID-19 will expire, so we can't be talking of post-COVID. She's going to tell us exactly what we need to do to survive through this period as the end president. Dr. Evelyn Shikana, can you hear me, Dr. Shikana? Can you hear me? Dr. Yes, Shikana? hello everyone. Hi. Hi, okay. Thank you, Dr. Naboya and, the, and everyone in the house. Good evening. It's really a great honor and uh, my pleasure to be here this evening. And I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Uh, Shoyombo. Thank God with you and your family that you went through it all and you are out victorious. Well done. 
So I'll just quickly go through my slides. Um, I'm basically to talk um, about dentistry and COVID-19, uh, what needs to change. Um, and uh, uh, quickly going through that, uh, I would just like to do a bit of introduction. Um, in Nigeria, the index case for COVID-19 was confirmed in Lagos on the 27th of February. I hope you're hearing me. Yes, perfect. Hello. Yes, we can hear. You can hear me good. Okay, February 27th. And by the third week, with escalation of cases, uh, some dental clinic owners uh, took the decision to shut down. Um, others waited for directives from the Association of Private Dentists and the Nigerian Dental Association. This finally came in the form of a recommendation for an initial two weeks shutdown by dental clinics in the country in the first instance while, we, while the situation is, is monitored. Since then, most dental clinics, especially in Lagos State, have remained uh, shut down for, say, about five weeks or more now. It's yeah, exactly. So, but clinics were asked to make sure they have the required PPE before they attend to emergency cases, especially non aerosol generating uh, procedures. So, far, we must all remember that uh, dental clinics are healthcare providers, and according to regulations, should stay open because the government says hospitals should be open. Uh, our patients are in distress. A lot of us will have been receiving phone calls. They've been calling. And uh, the owners of private practices and uh, staff are also in distress at this time. Uh, dental clinics cannot remain shut down for all true. And uh, like we say, post COVID, we don't know how long COVID is going to be with us. Forever, all shut down forever. So, there must be new normal. There must be a new normal. And, the, and changing the way providers approach patients' care will now be that new normal. Dental providers must give more attention to transmission-based precautions, like droplet precautions. We've all had that. We've heard a lot of that from Dr. Shoyombo, aerosol, bond, I mean, airborne precautions, contact precautions standard precautions, we must have uh, protocols for all these in our uh, facilities. And then the last thing, um, the last time, I must say the last time we had a major change in the dental pra the practice of dentistry was with the advent of HIV AIDS. I can remember uh, as a dental student learning how to do my dental procedures instructions without gloves or without face masks, you know, and then after the 80s, you know, when I was already into practice, it came for us to begin to use face masks and hand gloves. And I can remember it took a bit of a learning curve. So what's the way forward? Um, dental providers must set up best practices. We must put rules for infection prevention and controls and ensure that they are adhered to by all staff. This is to protect ourselves, to protect the dental team, to protect uh, our patients and to protect our families, neighbors, and friends. Uh, clinics must have protocols for before dental care starts, during dental care procedures, and then after dental care, and uh, even after work, procedures, uh, protocols must be in place. So what are the expected modifications that, that look, I'm looking at the Nigeria scenario and how far we've come and uh, uh, what we, we, we need to do. And then you see expected modifications from now on should be our questionnaires. Uh, we should have questionnaires for our patients. It shouldn't just carry uh, maybe their data and uh, medical history. We should include more questions from henceforth, uh, this, during this COVID-19, uh, COVID we should put questions about their travel history, about their uh, uh, many other things that we need to know about them, if they have cough or whatever, their medical, including their medical history. We must do uh, pre-screening. 
before the patients and when they come in, you know their vital signs, their temperature most especially. Uh, we've been doing that, but henceforth, we must have these checks, you know, just at uh, entrance into the hospital uh, is very important. And then looking forward from henceforth, we're looking at situations where when the uh, uh, COVID-19 rapid test kits come out, uh, practices should be able to get some do uh, the test for patients at very minimal cost before uh, they get to do, uh, uh, we see the dentist for procedures. And the telemedicine must begin to, to have a place in our practice in Nigeria also. Uh, we're looking at, uh, before now, our receptions used to be well decorated. We used to like uh, very uh, beautiful and uh, well decorated uh, receptions full of furnishing. But now uh, with COVID, we are going to have uh, to look at social distancing with uh, receptions that have less uh, magazines, less furniture, so that we have less things to for touch. We must look at uh, scheduling of uh, the patients. But before now, we used to have mainly walk-ins and uh, maybe hand up appointments, but uh, henceforth, we must look at uh, staggered appointments so that many patients don't come at the same time and they don't come in at close times. and. Uh, we can uh, have uh, better spacing. We look at addressing also must change. Uh, before now, uh, routine uh, clothing are used uh, in the clinic, but now we must, uh, like uh, the pictures Dr. Shiyombo showed, we must have uh, both patients and staff wearing face masks all the over the premises. We must have our patients also I mean, the dental staff also wearing uh, PPE in uh, the facility. Then doors. Uh, now most facilities or most clinics have doors that are functional. You open, you close. But uh, uh, we change. We are looking at having most doors permanently opened so that we'll have less touch of people having to open and close them. And only the essential doors will probably be opened. I mean, we'll be left uh, closed for constant openings and shutting. Then uh, looking at uh, continuing with the changes we're expecting, we're expecting more of our patient communication with our patients via phone. Patients will call in and then we will make calls to patients to ask relevant questions and book appointments. Appointments must be staggered you know, for social distancing. Only patients and uh, one accompanying person must be, should visit the clinic. Both should arrive clinic wearing face masks. Uh, you should wash uh, patients and, the, and those coming to the clinic should wash hands or use sanitizer at the entrance of the clinic for the step in or when they arrive inside. Then uh, temperature check on arrival of both the patient and accompanying person must be done. And uh, only the patient that requires care should enter the surgery. Uh, I haven't spoken about uh, the clients or the patients. We'll look at uh, administrative uh, control. Uh, it, it, uh, this is the time that there must be a lot of uh, change in the way staff work. Uh, the administration of the facility must uh, select staff those who are old or vulnerable, those with underlying health conditions must be asked to stay back at this time because it's like going to the war front. Uh, it's a good time to introduce electronic medical recordings, AMR for dental practice, so that we'll have uh, less groups around. And then introduce uh, cashless, more, less cash handling in the clinic environment also. Uh, there must be rearrangement of the reception to remove SS furnishing, and then we must, the management must ensure a continuous disinfection of common surfaces. Yes. With uh, COVID-19, there's going to be, have to be a lot of uh, technology and innovations coming up. New, we expect new equipment and innovations are expected to develop. They will start coming very soon. We'll start we'll keep seeing them. Then we are expecting changes for dental education, uh, dental schools. Students will need to take 
lectures and practical demonstrations, maybe virtually. Uh, training needs to be reinvented for the dental schools. But there will be challenges to contend with, with all this change. Because we have to deal with patient flow for students, uh, workflow, and uh, other processes. Then talking about cost, with all this new introduction, there's bound to be uh, uh, an expected increase in the cost of treatment. But it's not advisable for that to be now because uh, there's a lot to, we must uh, empathize with our patients. I know that a lot is going on even with them economically and, and, and socially too. But there, will, there should be a slight increase in the consultation fee to cover the cost of PPE, which can be explained to the patients with understanding. Um, looking at standard and transmission-based precautions and personal protections, some of the vital changes that will come. We expect all dental healthcare providers and personnel to adhere strictly to standard precautions, regardless of suspected or confirmed infection status of the patient in any setting where oral healthcare is delivered. Every patient must be seen as COVID-19. Dental precautions should include hand hygiene, use of PPE, respiratory hygiene, all the techniques we've learned you know, in, our, in our practice of standard precautions. We must wear surgical masks, eye protections, you know, and uh, all the new things that uh, uh, we've seen as Dr. Triumbo introduced to us. We also have situations where if marks are damaged you know, and breathing becomes or bit or breathing becomes a bit difficult, difficult, the mark should be removed and discarded immediately and uh, replaced. All uh, dental health care personnel should adhere to the sequence of the standard sequence of donning and doffing of PPE. That is where training of staff will really be very important because most of the staff they have to learn how to do this so that they don't contaminate themselves in the in the bid of trying to stay use these things. Uh, wherever basic PPE are not available, practitioners should not proceed with any dental procedure, regardless of emergency or otherwise. Uh, these pictures here are just to show the old look of uh, dental uh, nurses or assistants in the dental clinic, and then the middle one has the new look. More like the pictures we saw of Sorry, uh, we can't see the previous uh, presentation. <laughs> and this face mask and head cover and stroke mask, is, I, I saw it and I felt that it's, a, it's an indication. Hello. This is my practice. Uh, before uh, COVID, this was a, a doctor at work. And then a day before we shut down with the, the COVID uh, in, or oh, very, very close by or around. That was me working and I tried to do a bit of modification. Hello, we can't oh, see you. I, 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 I think I'm sharing my slides. No. Am I not sharing my slides? No. You have to start all over again. Hello? No. <laughs> Let's no. Start. Hello? We can't see no. you. Can you hear me? Yes. We would like you to probably uh, put your video on and share your screen. Remember, you put it on, but you took it off at some point. So we've not been seeing your screen. Dr. Shikena, <laughs> we'd love to see some of your slides, please. I know there's a lot of work that you've put in to put those slides together. So we'd love to see what you have to share with us today. All right, it's part of uh, what we're learning to do more and getting better at, you know, being comfortable with technology, being comfortable with the uncomfortable for those of us who are acquire technology a bit later, but it's part of it. We're just getting better every day, every day. I mean, so proud of seeing I think this is one of the times um, that all dentists need to come together yes. because things are going to be different. Like one of the things that's happened um, here, it's not just in Nigeria that everybody's in their own little area. The same thing happens here as well. But this is the first time that all dentists are coming together because yes. we all know that for us to survive this, 
I mean, um, you're talking about practices closing. We've got practices that are earning zero. And it's, you know, not government support, but not enough. But we all have to come together and learn how we're going to work in this new, in this new life. <laughs> And it's, I think this is the best time. And it's so great to see so many people on, on this webinar. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it back to you. Yes. And we, as I said, we have people from, you know, of course, the UK with yourself. And probably uh, we have uh, Dr. Yinka Leshi. I can see you there. If you're in Lagos or in the UK, you know, you're always across board. But we have people from Ghana, from as I said, Senegal, you know, um, Dr. Meli, Nate, Niran, we can see you, you know, and we have other doctors from uh, outside Nigeria. So it's really everybody needing to come together. It's no longer a question of, uh, it's a problem that is for the periodontists. I know periodontists are the most touched um, specialists here. It's no longer for the endodontist. It's no longer for the maxillofacial surgeon or the orthodontist, everybody, you know, is really um, affected. And I think the big message will be for us to look at it from the opportunity point of view as well, uh, in the sense that all eyes are on healthcare. All eyes and even businesses and investors want to be able to support healthcare sector. And as dental professionals, as I said, we are oral health um, physicians. So we need to also leverage and take a, a, a position, you know, in this debate. So it's not just about, you know, the various specialities apart is we have to even go beyond us dentists and really playing our part here. So thank you very much for talking about that collaboration. I think it's, it's one thing that we need to talk more about. It's everybody's contributions are welcome. Dr. Shikana, I don't know if you are able to, to log in back. All right, so she, she's not able to share her screen. Um, so we decided to have as many questions as possible. So I'll invite, remember, it's all about us sharing. We're here to learn from, from you. Uh, you know, you have taken time to join us in this webinar. We want to know what's going through your mind right now. Dr. Schoenberg has shared her story. You know, she's sharing her story from the UK as uh, a, a coronavirus survivor. She's talked about how she called the ambulance was right there next to her door. Okay. Now, God forbid anything happened. We're not praying. But we know that as dentists, we are at risk. We are really, you know, uh, we won't be staying at home forever. And the coronavirus is here. It's, nobody knows when it's going to be. So we are going to be exposed. You know, we are going to be exposed. So in Nigeria, we'd like if someone is wearing, uh, working in the public sector to be able to tell us more some of the support systems. We know we have the NCDC lines. I have personally called them when I came back from my trip. You know, at the beginning. So I've been on for seven weeks, because I came back and then had to put myself on self-isolation for two weeks. And as soon as I was meant to go, the government, you know, decided that we're going to lock down. So uh, I had to call the, the NCDC lines at one point because I was feeling funny. And I just wanted to test those lines to make sure that they're actually working. But now what is it that we have, you know, that can support us, you know, God forbid, if we need help. You know, we need to know, we need to talk about those things freely. So come with your questions or suggestions or sharing what you know. Uh, we are here to talk also about, you know, the guidelines and the protocols, you know, that uh, we have in place to be able to uh, use when we reopen. All right. So if Dr. Shikana is not back. I'd like to, I'd like to also say that uh, uh, Dr. Adeloye is here. Okay. But I don't know if we can unmute her yes. to say a few words. All right, Dr. Adeloye, can you put your hand up? And she's registered on the Adeloye, yeah? Hello, Dr. Chikana. Okay. 
Can you see where Dr. Adeloye is? Uh, well, I'm not sure what's happened to her. Okay. Um, I'll pick up. The name she used to log in. Yeah, yeah, I saw her name. You can unmute her. Okay. Uh, the co-host can actually unmute. Okay, if I find her, I will. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, from Carol Adelo. Okay, you are muted. Okay, good. I can see you now. And I will look for you and unmute you. So please hold on as we unmute you. Oh my God. Good. I'll make you a co-host. And yes, so uh, Carola Deloye, please, you can come up and share with us. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, good. It's, it's good to see everyone. Um, <laughs> hello. Oh, well, I, I don't know what you like me to share about my experience is it with um, having been diagnosed with COVID-19 how did you cope pardon how did you cope with it and um funny enough you know my symptoms were so different the symptoms I had was um I did not have a temperature all throughout neither did I have a cough so I went into hospital thinking I was having a heart attack because all I had was very severe chest pains. Uh, so that, that's what I was admitted for. And um, they did the blood tests and they said I had um, markers for, um, I had wrist markers for a heart condition, which was uh, surprising to me. Uh, but lately I found out that this virus affects all the organs, many organs. So uh, I was given anticoagulants immediately because they were still treating for either a heart attack or pulmonary embolism. And then it was after I had my CT scan that they found out that, um, that they found out that it was uh, COVID. So, the, the, the only thing I can bring to, to this uh, gathering is that the symptoms have really, really varied. And I was, um, oh, okay. No, yes, that the symptoms have varied. And I tried, I mean, I tested myself several times um, and my temperature was always normal and I had no cough. So I did not suspect that I had the COVID-19 infection at any point until it was formally diagnosed in hospital oh thank you very much <laughs> thank you carol Dr. for sharing uh so uh again it's uh i know some thoughts are going through some of our colleagues here in nigeria on other part of africa you know um wondering okay if anything had to happen here what type of support system again do we have i think that is something that in as much as we're talking about our practice you know the focus should be uh, even more on how do we protect ourselves okay so uh, we're in a pandemic as it says it's not an emergency uh it's our safety comes first even ahead of you know what we can do you know um to serve so what systems do we have in place here uh, in Nigeria. I think it's something that we need to, to, to talk about uh, in Lagos or any other, you know, part of the city. We need to know about what are the support system that we have. All right. I happen to have discussed with one of our colleague. Um, uh, she was in the UK and I told her, oh, you know, uh, she, she got stuck. She's the president of uh, Dr. Father and State, private practitioners. And um, she she mentioned that, you know what, I'm not sure if being in the UK, um, I'm better off uh, because, yes, you see sometimes ambulances queuing up and not being able to get some of these um, COVID cases in, you know, or some of these cases in the corridors because there's so much, so many cases. And, you know, I'm not going into the polemic of how well that was um, 
managed, you know, uh, in the UK. But she told me that here, at least as a professional uh, and a physician, you have some people that you know that could take you as a matter of priority into their hospitals and all that. But we need to know uh, that beyond that system, you know, that connection that we have, that there is a system in place, of course, that works, and we can also support um, the, the larger population. So I think that is important. So safety of all of us, because when this is over and it's going to be over, we want to ensure that we are standing. We want to ensure that our businesses are standing. And some of the questions that are coming are, you know, what can we do to ensure that we get back, you know, uh, and financially? And so that is some of the points we would like to discuss on the next uh, webinar. We'll be talking about the business side and the impact that COVID will have had uh, on our businesses. Uh, I think Dr. Um, Ishikena is here. Maybe she would like to share some, some slides uh, to be able to... Dr. Ishikena, are you ready? Okay, all right, good. Dr. Ishikena, are you ready? Do you want to put your video on? And um, yes, you are muted. So you can go ahead and probably ground, round up your, your few slides. You are talking about your, your practice, your team who would love to have. All right, we're not able to have her. All right, there, so there are a few things that I had personally put together uh, for the purpose of, of, of this meeting and uh, could use a few minutes uh, to share that with you. Uh, we like to make this as interactive as possible. So please, if you have any questions, uh, we have our moderator here that will be taking up um, and sharing those questions. So let me share uh, a screen and this uh, presentation will share with you uh, at the end of this webinar. So uh, thank you, Dr. Shambo, for helping us, you know, set up, you know, uh, some of our, our protocols. Uh, as it was said by the president, we had a recommendation, you know, from the association. And I have to use the opportunity to say this. I think we're not guided enough. We're not guided enough uh, by, you know, our uh, institution, by the government. There are a lot of things that I know we doctors had to go uh, constantly on the portal of uh, the British Dental Association or the ADA in America to be able to, you know. So I know it's something that is new, but we're all here to support our local association as well. And that's why, you know, the president decided to come here so we can hear from her. Um, and uh, one thing that, based on the recommendation, we took a position, and I'm going to really take responsibility um, for that, is the fact that we realized that closing was not going to, let's say, help the health um, system in general, in the sense that we wouldn't want some of our private, uh, our, our patients, you know, who have severe um, dental um, um, emergencies to go into some of these hospitals. So there was no, um, how could I say, urgent dental care as it is as it is found in the uk and with the help of dr shambo we decided to set something you know internally you know to be able to support our patients so we come up came up with this basic protocols you know to be able to run um these days sorry let me just close this all right good so of course we had a triage system um i believe you can all see my screen we had a triage system whereby when patients call, we are able to, through the telemedicine, because we, we have a, a doctor manning that portal, knowing if the patient is really uh, an emergency patient and needs uh, and in need of an urgent dental care. Uh, so if you have bleeding, we're able to, to know if it's uh, mild, moderate, you know, and uh, if it's really urgent, then perhaps you have to go into a hospital. Okay, swelling also, we had criteria to know, you know, if the patient is qualified um, to be part of this um, UDC clinic who are running the pain, etc., and trauma. So we use that to be able to identify 
those patients that are not urgent. We started by opening um, um, two days a week. And then we realized that we we're seeing patients that were not really, you know, uh, emergency patients. So we decided to add another level of triage to ensure that we don't see patients who are not qualified. I, I'm an orthodontist and I, I saw a couple of patients showing up with um, broken brackets. It's not the time for me to start refixing um, brackets or loose wires, right? So there are things that they could have done from the comfort of their home. And this is what this does, is to be able to ensure that the patient is able to be supported with um, DIY and then some instructions for them to handle their dental care at home. And as Dr. Shoyamba said, during this period, what we needed to do most is communication and communication with our patients. And um, this is something that we did through the online and the tele-dentistry. Now, the next level is to make sure that they have some of these uh, hospitals that are close to the practice for those um, life-threatening emergencies, you know, so they are guided as well. So you don't want to leave this patient because they are actually panicking and we are there as health professionals to tell them that we have a role to play and we are not, um, you know, we are there to help them even if it's remotely. So of course those um, protocols were put in place to ensure that, you know, uh, with the, the pandemic, you know, given the nature of its infectious, you know, nature, that we have a robust infection protocol in place. And of course this document is a living document, it's already changed already, you know, because as we get more information, we need to adapt and improve on this, all right? So we want to ensure that the staff, the team, that, has, uh, that is put up there is safe by using appropriate PPE and cross-infection procedures, but ensuring that also the patient is safe. So at this point, we consider that every single patient that comes to the practice is an asymptomatic you know, coronavirus patient. And we also consider that we ourselves as staff could be potential you know, uh, um, you know, uh, asymptomatic patients. So, we needed to have a protocol to protect everyone. And this is what we put um, in place uh, from the reception. I wouldn't go so much into detail to be able to ensure that the patient, you know, is after the screening, we know that he's confirmed to go through the UDC and he has clear guidelines on what to do when he comes into the building where we run what we call a text to chair protocol where the patients gets into the practice, into the parking and waits until you know he's uh, we come for him nobody waits in the reception so from the, the car the comfort of your car to um, the dental dental chair of course there's a protocol as to what do we do when you're guided through the building and how do change and turn around those treatment room including the x-ray room how do we dismiss patients you know uh, at the end of the treatment we even we don't take POS, we ensure that uh, as much as possible, they, they do their transfers ahead just to minimize um, this contact. So that is a bit of the, you know, the protocol that we have in place. We'll share that with you, all right? And of course, the surgery turnaround is very, very important. And I think this is where there's a big impact because we cannot, we have to book one patient for an hour and then wait at least 30 minutes you know, for that surgery to be cleaned and everything to settle, you know, to follow this protocol. And you can see that with this protocol, uh, we, we're likely to get into that once we reopen. And that will limit the number of patients that we can see. It will increase the cost with all the, uh, the PPE that we need to use for the, for the team. Of course, there's a checklist of what we have to do. And I would like to insist on this checklist because it's one thing to have something up is one thing to ensure that the staff understand how to use their PPE and you're constantly ensuring that, you know, you audit, you know, the entire process. All right, so those are some of the email information that we send to the patients, everything that we do from the reception with the questionnaire, we've talked about it. Um, of course, uh, there's a station to wash your hand even before you get into the practice. Uh, we take your temperature, the hand sanitizer are there. Patient is quietly, you know, are informed. And then of course there is, you know, what type of PPE do we use? Oh, 
to the cleaners, you know, the cleaners have to be protected. They're actually, you know, uh, we tend to forget them as part of this chart. To the person in the waiting room, um, the, the dental, the dentist and the dental nurse. So those are the things that we have that guides us as to what type of PPE and what protocol should we um, put in place. Now looking at the full gear, this is one of our doctor, you know, we're looking, you could see that she has an, uh, you know, an N95 mask, you know, but over it, we've put a normal face mask. And this is uh, the, for the simple reason that we cannot necessarily afford to change that mask after, you know, the first, uh, um, so I, I'm sorry if I'm breaching some protocols here because I need your guidance. What are you doing? I'm literally opening up to you to saying that, of course, we want to uh, ensure that we use maximum protocol, but you know, we know the cost of those masks. We want to protect ourselves. So what we did was to use those disposable masks over this N95 mask, and those ones can be disposed much easily. We have the screen, we have you know, um, all the other gears. Uh, we have even washable gowns that we had from the Ebola time. So again, it's a, we have to position ourselves that we were able to, uh, to remain strong when we had the Ebola time. And what is, what is it that we did in that uh, period? You know, there's some of the things that we can also add in, in the protocol. But we know that here it's more deadly and there are more things that we need to consider. So this is just me um, sharing with you some of the protocol that we've put in place. Of course, those information are available uh, out there on, the, on, on, on several websites. So I will not go um, in depth about this. This will be shared to everyone. So at the end of the day, what are the procedures that we were doing? You know, extraction was really the, the major procedure that you know, we had to do during this time, you know, incision and drainage, you know, some deep curettage, you know, but just using manual instruments. We are avoiding anything that could you know, generate aerosols. You know? So we avoid all these um, AGP procedures. Prescriptions, of course, we tend to do that usually already from the online consultation. And depending on the type of trauma, we're able to intervene extirpation of pulp for those endo, first stage endo. So just limiting the procedures. But I can tell you that for the five weeks that we've been on lockdown, there are some patients who were able to help. And this is an opportunity for people to understand how, you know, we can be part of uh, uh, keeping them, you know, their, uh, I won't say alive, but, you know, a, a patient said that he thought he was going to die from his toothache. So imagine you know, that lady we saw that was actually pregnant and, you know, uh, was going to go into her third trimester two weeks after, you know, uh, and couldn't sleep for two, two days. You know, we have a role to play. So where do we put the, the limits between, you know, um, we have to remain closed. So in terms of financial, I could say here that we didn't make money. We lost money. All right. It was minus because we had to invest in more PPE, having to have a logistic in place to go and pick the staff that were living in various places of, of the city. So uh, I'm just sharing this to say that, yes, we have a role to play in protecting ourselves, but we have also, where do we position ourselves with regards to the people that we serve? And we know for someone who has had a toothache, there are certain things that cannot wait. So thank you for... Um, listening i'm going to share this presentation as i mentioned and you know i'll be glad for us to go to some question and answers dr amy thank you so much my pleasure can you hear me yes i can hear you perfectly oh, yes. thank you so much okay. nice hearing from your side concerning the triage and how you actually assisted a lot of patients during this period. Some of us were not bold enough to go into it. We were rather so scared. I had to shut down about six or seven weeks ago. Immediately, the whole crisis started. But it's nice that we've heard from you, and there's a way forward. And exactly what I had in mind is what you have shared. And it is good for us to know that we must have a triage, no matter how small your artist is. I was speaking with a gynecologist in Abuja. I said, so what are you going to do about your triage? He said to me, I see my patients now from the window. 
And I have put up a, a placard, you don't come near the door. The security is there. So you don't come near. If you're a patient, all you need to do is uh, the security will call us at the window. We come to you and say, sorry, what can we do for you? If it's not an emergency, you go. But some of us can be lucky enough to set up a triage. The patient doesn't walk into our reception. So indirectly, we are going to have scripts. We will script from the entrance of, from the entry of the patient into our premises, from to reception to operatory. And we also have to know that sterilization to waste disposal is very important. How are we going to control infection? Dentists are the best adapters. We have adapted so well from time immemorial. I remember Dr. Shikena saying that we came out from medical school, we are using our hands, no gloves, no face mask. When HIV came, we changed. We are here now, we are going to change. And we'll continue to change. We keep improving every day. We need to put our infection control under to be super good. There is no, there is no way we should compromise infection control. Our patients must know why we are not there now, fully for them. We must be able to communicate, like you've said, and we should be able to train our team over and over. There should be a drill. Some people will say, oh, we are coming out of this, is down. Oh, so we are locked down. So we just get into our practice. Some other countries are saying, no, we can't get in like that. They must take some medications. I would actually want to know, is it necessary for us to go take these medications? Some are suggesting you take a hydroxychloroquine. And but before you take it, you have to visit your physician. Some are saying you have to take the chloroquine phosphate. What do we do as dentists before we step into our surgeries? First, to protect ourselves. I had to call up uh, an NCDC person and say, even if I have to open, I want to put make sure all my staff, I'm not pulling all of them now. I'm just bringing in two or three. We have to get ourselves tested that we are not COVID positive, including myself. If we are positive, the person will step aside and others will go on with the job because we, have, we are in community spread. We don't know who is COVID positive. We don't know who is not. So we have to be extra, extra careful what we are doing at this time. We must have this triage, which you have said, is very, very important. Not every patient can come into our surgeries. The status quo has changed, has changed forever. Every other thing that needs to come in, Dr. Shinobo has just shared with us, I think that should be the UV radiation, right? I'm not too sure. You must be able to tell us whether it's the UV radiation uh, uh, thing she was talking about to help control aerosol. But right here, we don't have that. What do we do? Are we going to leave all doors open and doors open? When we finish treating our patients, what do we do next? Some are advocating that we have to fog our surgeries. That we have to fog our surgeries with 1% sodium hypochlorite. So every we finish a procedure, we fog our surgeries and we close them up and wait for 10 to 15 minutes. How feasible is this? Is this worthwhile? Is it going to work? And then the use of 1% hydrogen peroxide has was to come in. These are all our dis in, in, in this contamination materials. What do we do as surgeons? People are out there. They should be able to tell us. Let opinions come. Let's know the way forward so that we don't expose ourselves. We are not as lucky as Dr. Shunyambo, who called the ambulance and they were there. There are so many people who are positive, they call the ambulance or even call the NCDC and they are not there. And today they are gone. We are doing our job saving lives, yes, but we don't want to die in the course of this uh, program. So others might have something to tell us, move us forward in the, in the Thank out you. there. So we'll be glad to also know what they say. Thank, thank you, Dr. Naboya. I would like to make a request. With us here today, we have Professor um, Larry Adeyemo, who is the Chairman Medical Advisory Committee in Luz. He's a, one of us. He's a, a, a maxillofacial surgeon. I would like to know if, uh, you know, he can contribute. We are all, it's all about collaboration, as uh, Dr. Um, Shoyombo said. 
and we we need some word of advice we need to know you know are we on the right track what are the latest information you know any information is good because tomorrow looks uh we we are seeing a bit of the light but perhaps more information you know will help us you know um guide us professor demo can we yes hello everybody yes can you hear me we can hear you we can see you thanks for joining us okay thank you very much um i like i actually thought this uh, is going to last for one hour, but it's really getting beyond an hour. But, but no problem. Uh, maybe I can also spare the next uh, five, 10 minutes. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Bola Shiombo, you are, you are recognized. And uh, my president of NDA, um, I'm not too sure you know me, but I, I think I know you very well. Um, Dr. Thank you for putting a lot of prayer on me to be able to find time to attend this. So um, um, essentially, I can only talk from the point of view of uh, um, Director of Clinical Services in a public hospital in Nigeria uh, with uh, our peculiarities. And also, uh, in the last five weeks, it's been, um, it's been really very hectic for us uh, as a hospital and also as a uh, one of the managers of the, of the facilities here. Uh, I'm also aware that many um, uh, of the participants actually work in the public hospitals and also some of them also work in the private hospitals. So um, the, somebody raised an issue that, that the most important thing that we should be talking about, apart, apart from talking about the signs of COVID-19, talking about IBC, talking about IDU and other things. It's um, the anxiety and the fear uh, that was really created by, by COVID-19. And it's, the fear is very real and it's still on. Uh, most of our hospitals are, are on lockdown. And um, whether we like it or we don't like it, the last two, three uh, presenters, we are going to open up one day. So the question is that uh, what do we do now? COVID-19 is here. And uh, what do we do now? And what do we do post-COVID-19? Um, um, it's also very um, nice and heartwarming to realize that on this platform, we have people who actually did extraction. Their hand and no blue gloves. I couldn't imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, where we were, where we were um, the use of gloves and the face masks were actually really very prevalent when some of us, uh, so when you are now sharing the chair, some of us cannot imagine what you are going to do there. But anyway, that was then, COVID-19 is there, and we are doing all the best to make sure that uh, we manage the, the situation. Lud as a typical hospital, um, unlike many other teaching hospitals, we have a very big, um, um, uh, facility here for COVID-19 patients and uh, we have a lot of uh, in terms of experience in the management in the last three weeks and also I uh, can assure you that um, COVID-19 is real. We have had um, more, more than 250 in terms of turnover in the last three weeks in Luth alone. I'm not talking about Lagos and uh, we have admitted over 100 of them and uh, presently, we have about 60 patients on our ward here. Yeah. And uh, we have recorded success. We have also recorded some uh, mortalities. There's no doubt about it. And uh, most of those mortalities are actually um, um, 60 and above with comorbidities, essentially. But quite a large number of our patients are doing well. And um, many of them have... Uh, very mild symptoms, and within within a week, they are able to clear the virus with a supportive therapy. And presently, now what we are doing is to give them uh, uh, antiretroviral, no to be to be to be precise. Also, we are also making attempt in the next few days and one week, we are going to start a clinical trials in Lou uh, with the use of uh, a chloroquine and hydroxy chloroquine. Uh, essentially. Um, most part of the hospital 
uh, shut down, I guess in the next one week, we'll be opening up a little. So what do we really need now? What we need now is to conquer, conquer fear and anxiety. And what is the best way to do that? The best way I usually say is that uh, we need to be, we need to be trained. The more training that we have, the safer we all are. So I realized that we have about uh, 120 or more people that are volunteer to be trained to, uh, to take care of patients with COVID-19. And I can assure you that uh, many of the people that have contracted COVID-19, whether in our hospital or any, any other hospitals, actually contracted it through, not through management of COVID-19 patients. All the people, I can say it with all certainty that everybody involved in the management of COVID-19 in Lou, nobody has contracted COVID-19 disease. Meaning that they were trained, they got the training, and the, the use of uh, PPE. We know the pathogenesis of, uh, of COVID-19, and we really actually know essentially that we really need to protect this part of the body. So uh, COVID-19 is not like Ebola. So, and uh, uh, based on our, both based on what we have read in the textbook, even before we have our center, and our experience in the last three weeks shows that uh, majority of the uh, patient, about 40% of them will not have any symptoms at all. About 45% will have my symptom. It's only very, um, maybe less than 5% that will actually develop severe symptoms that will necessitate uh, giving them oxygen or using uh, ventilators. So, um, what I will uh, advise everybody, or, or dentists, whether you work in a private hospital or you work in a public hospital, is to have adequate training in IPC. That's infection prevention and control. It is absolutely important. And the moment you are able to do that, um, the fear will go, the anxiety will go, and you'll be able to, you know, attend to your patient. Lose Despite the fact that we have a center here, we also take care. We have not shut down our AIE. We still do operation. We still, we still deliver babies. And uh, many other clinics by next week are going to open up. And the most important thing is for us to protect ourselves. And, uh, and of course, even our, our cancer center is open 24-7. Radiology center is also open. What we do is to provide the PPEs. However, I must also say that uh, for the public health sector, we have a lot of challenges. And the question is, if you are going to continue to, to survive, we need to change the model that we are using now. The model we are using now is not sustainable at all. That we have to struggle to get gloves, to get face masks, to get... So the question now that even those who will not even require pre-COVID um, surgical face masks or any face mask for that matter, by the time we open up next week, everybody will require that you wear one form of face mask or the other. So really, what we need to do is uh, to stop. You, have, you need to have that stock. And if you are going to have a stock in terms of uh, consumables, we really, really have to change the model we presently use uh, in terms of uh, uh, service uh, provision. All of us have to put our heads together. And I'm, some of my colleagues who are in Lou, I'm sure they are the they will bombard me next week by the time they open up. <laughs> and uh, that Professor when you said this on the. So we all, nobody knows it all. How we are going to move forward actually depends on all of us. Yeah. So that at the end of the day, we are safe, our patients are safe, and also those who work with us. But we can't but come back to work because we have, in Nigeria presently, evidence has shown that uh, we have extensive community transmission. Meaning that whether you're at work or you're not at work, you are prone to, you know, being exposed to COVID-19, meaning that we cannot run away. So what we need to do is to brace up and make sure that we need, we need the, uh, we do the need. And the greatest challenge is going to be in terms of funding for the public health sector. And we really need to tackle that. We need to change that model. Otherwise, we'll have a lot of uh, issue in our hands. And I believe that... Uh, if you are able to uh, survive the uh, um, HIV epidemics, then I believe that uh, this one also, putting our heads together, 
we should be able to uh, forge ahead and uh, do the needful. And dent dentistry is peculiar because we walk around the mouth. And that is going to be a challenge in terms of a, a physician who can afford to say, okay, you keep a distance, you do teleconferencing. After teleconferencing, you need to remove the tooth. You can't remove a tooth through teleconference. Yeah, you cannot drill a tooth through teleconferencing. So you need to you need to see the patient and protect yourself, protect the workers around you, and also protect the patient. Like I usually do when we when this fair started. Uh, when some of our colleagues, not necessarily dentists, when we ask them to see any patient, uh, some of them will uh, ask, I need to see the, um, the COVID-19 test of the patient. And I laugh. I laugh. The, the reason why I laugh is that, uh, what about if the patient requests that he wants to see your own test? So uh, what, are you, what are you going to do about that? So the truth of the matter is that even the testing, the testing based on the procedures that we have now, has about... 20-30% false negative, meaning that the fact that you are tested as is negative does not mean that you have COVID-19. So what it means is that we really, really need to protect ourselves. And of course, we know that we have uh, quite a large number in terms of percentage of uh, non-symptomatic carriers. So it is important that we brace up and we make sure that we, uh, in terms of our training in IPC, and uh, in terms of a uh, provision of, uh, of, uh, of uh, PPE. Otherwise, we would have a lot of issue mm -hmm. in our hands. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Deyemo, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know how I made sure that, you know, you kept this on your, your calendar. So thank you very much for sharing. And again, it's the time for a collaboration. And we have the opportunity with you being the, the chairman, you know, of the medical advisory committee, but being, you know, uh, one of us as a maxillofacial um, surgeon, you understand even more. And we, we, we to, to get your, uh, make sure that we keep you, you know, on our speed dial to make sure that you are the person that we can reach out to, you know, anytime we have this platform. So we'll be glad to have you uh, not commit now, but we know we're going to call on you because we need information and we appreciate. And you said something, you know, very important. Uh, it doesn't pay anyone to just be in fear mode, right? Because the COVID-19 is here. It's going to be part of us. We remember how we used to travel in the past, going into the plane with our water, with our shops and all that. Now, we go through all this screening machine. You can't take a bottle of water. You know, sometimes my daughter asks, why do you even take this? Why can't we take water? Well, it's not harmful. But you see, those protocols are now set. And we all know that it's part of what the, the guidelines for the aviation, you know, protocol. So there are some protocols that are just going to be part of how we're going to practice dentistry. And you said something very strong. Let's make sure that we are educated and we are trained, we train our staff, you know? Some people don't understand how severe this is, you know, even outside the practice or outside the, the hospital. So education, training, and this platform, you know, with everybody being here, we really appreciate your uh, contribution. There is a question that came probably for, to the NDA president and saying that, you know, how much can we uh, accommodate the cost? I'm sure it's for somebody that is in the private sector, you know, the cost of all this PPE. What are the stakeholders doing? You know, is there any possibility of, uh, you know, the government, you know, coming up with some form of their PPEs, you know, because you see, when you start having a scarcity of some of these um, uh, items, we tend to recycle. And as you recycle, some of these uh, barriers that you think you have may not even be effective. So how can we ensure that we don't run out of this PPE? You know, uh, I don't know if Madam President is there or anybody wants to, to support. Uh, hello. Yeah. I don't know if I can be heard. Yes. Am I on? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good to be back. You know, I got caught off with the digital thing, internet failure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think basically with uh, how to sustain uh, the PPE uh, that we need for dental practice, a very difficult question to answer. 
because um, if we all listen to the media, I think just yesterday, uh, the Honorable Minister of Health was talking about scarcity, even for, for government to be able to get these things. All over the world, you know, everybody's cramming for their use. And we all know that these are uh, material that are important for now. Though we've still seen some um, uh, companies, I think uh, fabric uh, uh, chlorine shops or uh, fa a company, uh, fabric making companies who are now like uh, producing some of this uh, PPE. Uh, there was one that was shared on one of the platforms, Tiffany Amber, and I think I saw Dr. Also, another one in PPE. So we could try and link up with this group, I um, mean, these companies in Nigeria and book, make up, place others. And also, some of our colleagues have spoken about uh, improvising some of these things. Like when I had from the last sharing, I went through the, uh, had the discussion and I heard about raincoat, nylon um, coverings. We could get those things improvised for now. They are cheap, 200 naira for one, and then get them over our outings, our outfits, they can be disposed. Then the ones we can, uh, um, I, I'm talking about cost, by the time you, you, you put your, um, you get the cost of producing those things within Nigeria, the shops that have them, you'll be able to work your cost price and then be able to now put that, divide that over the patients you think you will see. Just a minimal increase is what I would advise for now because I don't think the patients can even take a, a, a. All right. Thank you very much for sharing. I Hello. Think Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, Dr. Sh Hello? Yes. I think what we can, can we can hear you. All right. Uh, it's, it's quite nice that Dr. Shikena has spoken about the fact that we can get raincoats. I think that is not going to be quite right for infection control. No matter how expensive, I don't think the PPE is rather too expensive. We came to a stand on the last webinar that we will get our regular, we're not going to have the full hazmat uh, suit. We're going to have our regular surgical gowns, not the cloth type, but the disposable ones. On it, we can then put an apron. I saw on Dr. Shoryambo's uh, trials that her people had the kit on and they had an apron on it. Hello? Hello can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. All right. They had an apron on it. That apron can be made from very soft nylon just like what we use in a uh, barrier for our dental chairs. So that once you're done with that, if the, your assistant can actually clean you down, fine. But be careful how you take that out while you take out your gloves with it. We're double gloving, right? We've agreed to all double, I think we have agreed that we should double glove. Our first glove goes out with that nylon and our PPE is still there. And Dr. Emmy has said, we can actually uh, uh, design it in such a way that patients for similar procedures can be seen with one PPE. But we cover up again with a new uh, nylon made of, our apron made of nylon. That will see us through. Then the proper decontamination of ourselves. I am even thinking, there's nothing wrong if we can get a fogging machine, a small fogger. The fog is actually help us to, you know, decontaminate ourselves, our assistants and ourselves, and then the surgeries, and we close off. Right now, we are not going to go full scale. Like I said to myself, I'm going to do a soft start. I think that's what we agreed on the other time. It's going to be a soft start. Now we are not doing aerosols. Dr. Shinoba has told us, we don't have the negative pressure chamber. The one we saw with you looks quite good, we're going to start wrapping our heads around that now. None of us have the HEPA filters. We don't have the UV irradiation uh, machine. We might start thinking of bringing that in, if it will help. But we can't all go in a hurry to buy things that perhaps we can't even afford right now. And it's not going to be cost effective at the end of the day. But for PPEs, please let us, anything on infection prevention and control, 
please let us not economize. It's going to be for our good, for the good of our patients and for our staff and our own practice well-being. Coupled with the fact that this is not a period to make profit. We know that things are tough. Whatever it is that we have to charge our patients, let us just, it might not be, we might even be making losses. Dr. Amy told me, told us now, she made loss. There's a time we are going to recover and make gains. So this is very, very important that we take note of this. In our practices, have we not been doing some services for free before? We have. So we, this is a little sacrifice. Let's not compromise on PPE. It's just unfortunate we live in a country. I asked someone yesterday, who is a maker of masks in Nigeria? Do you know how much he told me mask? 50 for 14,000. Mask you used to buy for 450,500. Yeah. 14,000 is his mask for 50. And I said to him, do you know that this mask you are giving to me, my patients are also going to have out of this mask because no patient will walk into my outfit without picking a mask. Even if they come with their mask, they'll be given a mask. And other things will be added. And he said to me, ah, I'm not in a, I, I cannot talk about that. How, how can we buy what used to be 500 for 14,000? But what can we do? We have no choice. Yes. We want to be able to quietly go back into our practices slowly. So I will just advise that for now, it's going to be a soft start. Mm -hmm. In the issue of aerosol lifting, Dr. Shabba has told us the negative pressure chamber. We have not been able to construct that. People are advocating the use of electric motors. They have no anti-retraction anti anti uh, valves. We are, I don't think most of us have that yet. And so we are going to go back to our low speed hand pieces, which we were using when we were in medical school. We are going to go back to our hand instrument for scaling and polishing mm -hmm. for now, mm -hmm. until the atmosphere feels a little bit clearer. And still, we have all been told, every patient, including myself and my staff, are all COVID positive to proven otherwise. Thank so we are going to take precautions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank but you. we still I'm have so much to learn from others as well. I mentioned we have a, a passionate dentist as part of our moderator today. There is a, word, a couple of, uh, quite a number of questions on the chat. Thank you. We, may, we will respond to some of these questions even when we are offline. And there is a Ben that mentioned, um, of course, in line with the, co uh, the collaboration that we're talking about, you know, as Dentists, we need to make sure that we are not just uh, periodontists, orthodontists, maxillofacial surgeon. We are all, you know, oral health um, um, physician, and we have to play our role in the big, you know, uh, healthcare sector. And we even know that all eyes are on the healthcare, but we know that the healthcare economics, is, you know, has a global problem. You know, it's a, it's outside Nigeria, and we know also that Nigeria is, uh, you know, healthcare is particularly underfunded, as Ben is is writing here as a suggestion. So we need to see how we can uh, collaborate beyond Nigeria. You know, it may require, as Ben recommends here, a lot of lobbying. So it is time for dentists uh, and uh, healthcare physician to be more than just physician. Our skills, we always have the skills. We need to see how we can play our role, you know, outside our hospitals, outside our practices, and engage in, you know, and make contact, you know, with other stakeholders there. Because we cannot work in isolation and succeed, you know, outside, you know, what is happening globally uh, and what is happening beyond our profession. So we need to be able to um, take a call and play our role as well. So that is what we're saying. The NDA president is here. We could come up with a group, you know, again, if, if you don't ask, you know, you may not get. And people are actually getting funds from other, you know, um, kind donors. So let's see how we can come together, you know, and speak with one voice and get help. We need help. Our profession, you know, is very much at stake and we need everybody working together. Okay, someone asked a simple question. I mean, the question is very key. As part of the protocol, it is said that, yes, we should keep the doors open, the windows open, no AC. 
at all, no AC. How can we operate with no air conditioning? You know, uh, how will our patient be comfortable? How will we be comfortable? But we know, I don't know, does anybody has an answer to that? Dr. Amy, can I answer that question? Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Uh, there's the way out of that. What other people in other countries have proposed is this. Your ACs are on when the patients are not there. Once yes. you, you're going to bring in the, 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 all the surgeries are cool and nice when the patients are not there. But once the patient enters, because you have already chilled up everywhere, you can leave the doors open for cross ventilation, your windows open. If you are going to raise aerosols, and there's nothing wrong even if you're not raising aerosols, to leave them open. And because you have already done your triage, your patients are not going to be so long on your dental chair. So as soon as they leave, you should, like I said, if you, can, if you have the fog, you fog. You fog the surgeries, you close up the ACs again, and the windows, and then you leave there for another 10, 15, or 20 minutes. Some people are advocating 30 minutes after fogging for your surgeries. And when you are done at the end of the day, you still have to fog the whole surgeries. You cannot say, oh, I fog because patients are, as they are leaving, you are fogging. At the end of the day, you must also carry out what we call a decontamination of the whole premises. Right. Of the whole premises. That's very important. We can put on our ACs. When the patients are there, we can leave our doors open. Our receptions might not be open. We can choose to leave the windows open and the ACs open. Provided there's cross ventilation. We, most of us cannot ex uh, install the exhaust fan. That's one other instead. That we put on the exhaust fan. We have space for that. It was not part of the construction when we were setting up the practice. So it's going to be very difficult to bring in the exhaust at this time. So what do we do? In absence of this called HEPA filters that can help us, I had to call somebody who supplied new conditioners there. If, do you have HEPA filters that can go with these air conditioners? He doesn't even know. Because there are some ACs that have HEPA filters installed in them. He doesn't even know. So we are in a tight corner. What do we do? We don't have HEPA filters. We don't have UV radiation lights. We have to work with what we have. Like I said, we will go softly. Just softly. We go gently. None of us, I think, has the electric motor that has anti-retraction hand pieces. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we still go back again to our so-called hand instruments. We were trained with hand instruments. Mm -hmm. In my time, I never used ultrasonic scaler until several years. Mm -hmm. I never used the high speed hand pieces. We are using the low speed. Okay. So we can start with those ones slowly, but we will not do major things for now. We take it gently, pending when we know that this infection is under control. And I know that our presenters today, even our uh, Professor Dayem, they had a mantra gift to us all to go with. It's important that we have a mantra from Dr. Shonabo, Professor Adeyemo, and any other person in the, in the, in the COVIDians. I call everybody COVIDians. You know, we are all the audience of COVID. <laughs> so they might have a mantra to give to us, which will actually help to allay our panics. This two webinar has actually given me the boldness to say, good, I'm going to go back. You understand? Even when I put everything in place, I was too scared to even enter the surgery. I was panicking. You know, you begin to panic and it's like you're so, you're, you begin to actually want to scream at your patients. <laughs> it was as bad as that. So we have a, they should give us a mantra before we go. Yes, please. I think one, one of the things I would like to say, uh, first of all, Professor Adio, that was really good. And all the speakers have done very well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I want to say is that, um, interestingly enough, having gone through this, I'm not scared. Um, I'm actually more convinced that we all have to work together and, you know, fight this. Because it's here to stay. It's everywhere. So we've got to get used to it. And we've got to... Um, reassure ourselves, our colleagues, our staff, our patients that 
you know, we can do something about it. So I'm, I'm, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Adeloye will say the same thing. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Adeloye. Adeloye, you want to, to unmute yourself to say something to the uh, survivor? Okay, I've unmuted um, myself. Well, having gone through it, I think a lot of people will get it. But like the professor said, it's a very mild illness for most people. So there's nothing to, to be scared about. What is most scary is the future of dentistry and how it's going to pan out. I don't think it'll ever be the same. And, and that's the unsettling thing. I think Thank this is you. where dentists have to really come together. Um, for example, in England at the moment, like I said earlier on, they're only, <clears throat> out of thousands and thousands of practices, they're only 150. Um, for example, in the small town where I am, we're normally probably a lot of patients. Um, I mean, lots of practices, there's only one open. And it is serving probably thousands of practices. And all the dentists are actually working together. It's absolutely amazing. So, um, for example, the oral surgeons in our practice are now working in another practice. And all this, believe it or not, for no pay during this period. And, <coughs> and we're getting the, the public are very happy. The uh, ministers are beginning to look and say, oh, that, those dentists, see what they're doing. What can we do for them? When patients have confidence in the profession, there's so much more we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would like to uh, thank Dr. Shoyambo for your contribution. Professor Adeyamo, we'd like to hear from you. You have reassured us, you know, so please, we are not afraid. You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's dentist versus COVID, but yes, uh, we, I think <laughs> this webinar, you know, with a little bit more reassurance that, you know, we are here and we are going forward, you know, and just building ourselves. Professor Adeyemo, some word of advice. We can't hear you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You have muted again. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So the, the, the issue, um, I, I know that as it applies to the private uh, setup, so it's also applicable to the public setup in terms of uh, cost recovery. The last but uh, one speaker was talking about, and this is, this is real, a pack of uh, face masks it used to be about 600, 800 naira. Let me give you an example. Last week, the last two weeks, we bought uh, 70 packs that ordinarily should be more than 56,000 naira. And we bought it for 980,000 naira. So, how do we recover that cost? I know it's not going to probably last for a long while, but in the next two, three, four months, most likely we are going to be faced with that. So we need to think who is going to bear the cost? Private, public, you have to think about that. The second one is the issue of the user, the need to use a, in our clinic, AC. As a surgeon, it's practically impossible in the theater not to use AC. Infection control mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I also assure you that uh, we are getting to know so many things about IPC, infection, uh, infectious disease, and uh, based on these uh, current knowledge. But as solution center in Lou, we have four floors. And all the floors, you have AC there. We have extractors. Mm -hmm. However, you may okay. say that, yeah, we may be able to do that because we are not doing any procedure that is uh, also generated. But the question is that, uh, as a surgeon, you have to be in the theater, there has to be AC, Meaning that we need to bring in, because I remember it gave us a lot of uh, stress when we are preparing the, the center. It took us one about one month. We have to bring in so many, many of these, uh, what we call engineers, 
Many times we put this one, they break it down again or to able to get it right. So the question is that we, the engineers, also really have to really come in and actually be part and also moving forward post during COVID and post um, uh, um, uh, post post COVID. Well, the most important thing is that as a, as a, as a body, whether in Nigeria, in Africa, or all of us together, we need to have a, what we call practice guideline now more than ever in terms of uh, moving forward so that um, everybody most likely will be on the same page with some little modification here and there based on your peculiarities. But we need to have a general, uh, a general procedure in terms of uh, moving forward because as um, the challenge some of us will have as working in public sector is that uh, by the time you have a uh, you discuss with your, with uh, with uh, maybe your consultants, your resident doctors. Everybody will bring his or her own idea. At the end of the day, you realize that there are so many things that may not be affordable, and you need some minimal. Otherwise, we we'll say that we are not going to work. For those in public sector, patient will keep on coming. For those on private sector, no matter what we do now, even if we don't return back to our our uh, clinics because of uh, our patients, but we have to return back because <laughs> of, of, uh, of if we don't do it because of God, we, we do it because of ourselves. So what we what we need to do is to brace up to the challenge and make sure that we 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 put our heads together, like uh, uh, Dr. Ami was saying, and chart a way forward so that we will, uh, we don't know for how long this is going to be. We don't, really don't know. Maybe in other parts of the world, like UK, you have, they have an idea. But now in Nigeria, I think, to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. just when we are just when we, we are not at the peak yet. And we don't know when the curve is going to get flattened. So, but the question is that there are collaterals already. We have to reduce the collaterals. All that, we have to remember that other diseases are not run, running away. Oral cancer is still there. Dental cancer is still there. Dental avular abscess is still there. People will still have fractures. People will have uh, pain from their teeth and they want to do procedures. So the question is that we need to balance so that at the end of the day, we will have, uh, we will normalize um, things for ourselves so that we can have uh, 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 a peace in terms of a uh, peace of mind. And whether COVID is there or is not there, we are doing the best. Yeah. The most people is to protect ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, thank you for sharing. I mean, uh, I, I see a lot of the comments uh, here, you know, saying thank you and all the keep up the good work, you know, in the center at new. And uh, we really appreciate you being here. So again, it's all about the collaboration. We've talked about it, you know. Uh, I attended a, a, a webinar yesterday, uh, or was it on Thursday? Yes, uh, yesterday from the Anada group. Uh, I think Dr. Enoma Alade, I don't know if she's still here. Uh, she's part of the board. So she happened to be a dentist, but she stopped practicing dentistry. And they were talking about the food, you know, of the healthcare, you know, and the impact that the COVID has had. Uh, they were talking about a lot of uh, public and private partnerships. So we need to be creative and see how we can work together. We cannot look at, you know, the private sector separately from, you know, the sector there are things that you know we can put together you know to be able to uh confront i mean combat this this pandemic uh on that note uh i know we've put a pool uh out for people to share what they would like to hear more and it looks like it's all about us knowing more about uh those guidelines and those um protocols that needs to be put in place come monday 4th of may the doors are open the light is on. Are we ready? We know that through this webinar, we have put the fear level down. But those protocols have to be up. If you are not ready, don't open. That's my advice. Open, as Dr. Naboya said, maybe in phases. So you have time to train, educate first and foremost your team, you know, ensure that they go through the protocol before they physically appear on, on, the, on the floor. You know where that's supposed to see patients. Educate your patients. Our patients will need us more than ever. So I think it should not be like a patient will need us more than ever. So it is an opportunity post-COVID for us to do better. 
right. So thank you very much for uh, you joining us here. Dr. Shambo, thank you. Thank God for your, for your life and uh, that of Ayo. And, uh, you know, thank you for sharing again, you know, your, your stories. And, uh, you know, for me, I was just watching uh, the coronavirus, you know, patients on TV. And I thought, you know, it's in China. It's that far away. So by sharing with us, we know that it's coming. But with Professor Adeo, no. Thank you. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for sharing. We're all in this together. We will go through this together. We will see the light. Yes. And God is, you know, protecting us. Thank you, Dr. Naboya, for moderating this, this session. All right. And we look forward to the next webinar where we'll be sharing more information. So stay safe. Stay at home even after the 4th of May if you do not have to be out. Oh. And again, we have all of this sharing information. So, Dr. Anadak, if uh, Dr. Uh, Enoma, we'll be glad to have you, you. on the next one. She has so much, so much information, you know, both from the international perspective, you know, when she practiced as a dentist in the States before coming back. Um, the future is for us. The future is in our hands, and let's make sure that we play our role. There is no hiding. Have a good evening. To those who have put their questions on, you know, we're going to respond to your questions off the screen. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Shoyambo, uh, you know, and uh, Lola. Yes, th thank you very much for joining, and Dr. Naboya. Thank you to all the participants. This is uh, the biggest pool we've had so far, and which shows uh, and interest in what we are sharing. And it's all about this collaboration and learning from each other. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I, uh, thank you. Just have to thank say, you. I've added an extra hour. So thank you for being here with us. But I have to make sure that thank you. You don't go beyond. COVID, COVID is not a roadblock. Yes. So like I said before, COVID is not a roadblock. It is just a break. We are holding our breaks. There's no roadblock. <laughs> There's no roadblock. Thank you. There's no roadblock. The light is on. Light I, could I suggest, uh, make a suggestion? Yes. Yeah. Uh, because it, um, one of the things that's happened over here is the amount of communication we get. Because it's so amazing how people aren't aware of a lot of things. So, for example, the protocols that you put in place, it would be so nice if it's shared with everybody. So that they, you know, everybody knows what's going on, and then people can put ideas, and, you know, because there has to be a starting place, and then everybody can build from there. And that's what's happened here. We send information out here in England. It, they're lucky because a lot of things come from the chief dental officer, and then they, you know, the local areas then work on that. But in this situation, what's actually been happening is all the dentists have been represented represented at the table, so they go in and then put their ideas, and that's what's incorporated in all the policies that are coming out. So if you share some of what you've got, right down to the, um, you know, how do you, I, I noticed somebody said, how do you treat a pediatric patient? Uh, some of those things are in the document. So if you share that, and then, you know, of course the pediatric, uh, pediatrician, um, ped pedodontist can have an input, and it'll be amazing how things just go from there. Then have a working part, a working group that's looking into how do we do these things. You need to have these groups going now. That's what we've got happening in England. And we all need to be collaborating with Nigeria, with America, with Canada, with China. We all need to be learning from each other and seeing how we can develop our own local area to suit um, ourselves. Because like um, Professor said, the biggest problem is funds. I mean, you were talking about the masks. Um, <clears throat> masks are coming out of China now. Masks that we were buying for four pounds, they're coming from China for 56 pounds. I mean, that is unbelievable. A box of 50 masks for 56 pounds. So if it's 56 pounds, I don't know how much it's going to be when, by the time it comes, you know, with shipping and all that. Guns we were paying for two pounds. They're coming out at a lot of money. How can we afford it? We can't. It's unsustainable. 
So somehow we all have to get together because this is happening and it's going to be the same in America, everywhere. We all share the same problems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shambo. <laughs> so I know you have some questions. People want to see, uh, we would like to have your slide as well. People want to see the image of that innovation table. So that's from Dr. Newman in Ghana. We will uh, definitely share the presentations uh, we had here today. So just be rest assured. So thank you very much for those who joined us beyond um, Nigeria. We have Ghana, well represented, as I said. And we also had um, Senegal, we had um, Cote d'Ivoire, you know, we had people from uh, Rwanda, Kigali, you're welcome. Dr. Tutu from Houston, Texas, welcome. Dr. Enoma, Aladi, you're there. We look forward to hearing from you the next time. We're running out of time, and uh, you have so much information for us, and you are a and very much active in, um, you know, the healthcare federations with the ANADAC group. So thank you all for joining us. Dr. Leslie, have you in mind, okay, for probably the next one. And uh, I thank everyone. I thank everyone, honestly, for joining. And at this point, we're going to conclude and end our webinar on this, uh, on this note. So God bless you all. And um, stay safe Bye for now. So that's from me, Dr. Amy. Uh, I'm passionate about, you know, empowering, yeah. and growing our, uh, raising the standard, you know, of our dental, the way we practice dental. Yeah. Yeah. So this is my passion, and that's why I'm motivated and driven by, you know, sharing and mentoring and getting to also learn from you. All right. So thank you if I gave you some calls at what hour, <laughs> open you messages, you know, many reminders being here today but it's all about that collaboration we're talking about so thanks again have a great you know workers day thank you have a great weekend we'll see you on the next series okay. on friday next week thank you very much that's a shame bro. thank you for thank you thank you Dr. thank you we had a bit of uh issues but it's part of what we're all learning to do better all right, thank you and see you. Before you go, can I ask a question? Yes. Oh, to Prof. Gone. Oh, Prof. Is gone. Oh, is Prof. Gone. Oh, okay. No, I was, I was just going to ask. Yes, yes, yes. Prof. Is gone. But behind the scene, you know, we'll continue this and this collaboration. No, he's there. Prof. is here? Okay. We will continue the discussion behind the scene, um, especially with your suggestion about us forming that group. Um, well, 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 we, see your, we have your beautiful picture. We'll have mm -hmm. to say bye bye. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So on this, we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much, all. We'll stay in touch and then we'll continue this discussion. This is just the beginning. There is so much that we will do together. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you for all your valuable questions. Thank you. So, bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes.